Okay, good afternoon and uh, welcome to uh, this next in our, in our speaker series at the College of Law. Uh, I'm Dwight Newman, the, the chair of the speakers committee. Um, we're delighted to have with us today uh, Professor Amanda Peters from the South Texas College of Law. Uh, and this is, of course, an event uh, co-sponsored with uh, Just Rights, the uh, student group interested in human rights and social justice issues. And we're, we've been very pleased to cooperate with them on the event and thank them for all of their contribution. Um, Professor Peters worked for a number of years as a criminal prosecutor um, prior to joining the, the South Texas uh, faculty. Um, since joining that faculty, she's taught in a, a number of areas, including legal research and writing, but also including criminal law, uh, human trafficking, uh, and she's uh, developing a course on criminal litigation. She's also taught on human trafficking at the National University of Ireland, um, and uh, has this as, a, as one of her research interests, and we're delighted to have her uh, here today to speak about legal disparity in the protection of human trafficking victims. And, um, uh, I was going to say, with no further ado, I'll welcome Professor Pierce, but uh, we do have a little request first. Um, um, uh, the, the lecture is, of course, free, but Professor Peters' children love foreign coins, and so <laughs> if you don't mind uh, passing some uh, no, Canadian coins along, <laughs> we'll, we'll gather them for her. And, uh, um, uh, but uh, we don't usually take an offering, but uh, um, yeah. if you don't mind. Uh, this was not my request. <laughs> it wasn't her request, you. but uh, we just thought we'd help her out on that. So. Yeah, I learned about loonies and toonies and thought of loony tunes and comedies and stuff. <laughs> but, but welcome. Uh, and and there's, it, this is supposed to show up here, Professor Newman, oh. and it's not, so. Okay. Yeah, my kids like foreign currency, and my parents used to own a coin shop. I was born in Detroit, but we're mostly from Texas, and that's where I live right now. Um, and my dad owned a coin shop and had like 420-something Canadian pennies. Uh, and I've never had any use for them, so I thought when I came to Canada, I would exchange them out. And some of them were quite old, from like the 40s. Um, so I brought a big bag of Canadian pennies and was really hoping that um, no one would think I'm doing something illegal um, with the pennies. But um, <clears throat> I want to thank Just Rights, and I want to thank uh, the law school for allowing me to come here. Uh, Houston, Texas is a long way from here, um, but I grew up some on the South Plains in the United States, and so I was excited to see the Northern Plains, and everybody has been so welcoming. Um, Saskatoon's a beautiful city, and I had, what did I have last night? Oh, poutine. Poutine. <laughs> poutine. <laughs> and, uh, and I've heard a few A's, so I feel very uh, exposed to the Canadian uh, lifestyle here. But um, I'm here today to talk about something more somber than uh, Canadian coins and um, poutine. Uh, so I wanted to talk a little bit about human trafficking. I realize this is kind of a hot topic and area uh, of law in the United States, and it may be here as well. And by the way, can everyone in the back hear me OK? All right. Um, <clears throat> I want to give you a brief legal background on human trafficking. And I didn't want to be the egocentric and self-centered American and just talk about American things. I'm bringing Canadian stuff in as well. And so when there is something that I can talk about from Canada in relation to what I'm discussing, I will address that as well. Um, first of all, legal tr the legal world kind of responded to human trafficking around 2000. Uh, that's when the United States passed one of the first uh, comprehensive modern trafficking laws called the Trafficking Victims Protection Act also known as TVPA. And the Trafficking Victims Protection Act was uh, enacted in 2000 before Bill Clinton left the White House. And at the same, in the same year, the United States and Argentina drafted an international document for the UN called the Palermo, Palermo Protocol. And both of these uh, documents criminalize human trafficking, or they encourage countries to criminalize human trafficking. And they have some common goals. Uh, the first is to prevent human trafficking uh, from occurring. Um, this is usually done through ad campaigns. And I've actually got a book here written by Benjamin Perrin, who is a professor at University of uh, the, the British Columbia Law School. Um, and this is a really good trafficking book, if any of you guys are interested. It's called Canada's Underground World of Human Trafficking, Invisible Chains. Um, he, I believe, is taking a temporary leave from the law school because he's working with the um, I, the Prime Minister or someone at the very top of the Canadian uh, government um, in relation to human trafficking efforts. But you see in the TVPA and, and the Palermo Protocol these policies of preventing 
um, human trafficking, prosecuting traffickers, protecting victims, and this is where my research lies, and in partnerships. And partnerships is a more recent um, P in the four pre P prong, but these first P's are called um, the three P paradigm. And you'll see them in legislation around the world, um, whether it be international legislation or national legislation. Um, the United States has kind of become the trafficking watchdog. Uh, it's a self-appointed title. Um, uh, we, I guess, like to kind of use our weight and throw it around a little bit worldwide, and it's no different when it's in human trafficking concept, context. Um, the Trafficking in Persons Report is authorized through the TVPA, we call it the TIP Report. It is released every June, and it monitors nation's efforts at regulating human trafficking. It monitors whether they're preventing, pro preventing uh, and prosecuting and protecting um, as required by the law. So you might be asking yourself, how does the U.S. have the authority to basically regulate what other countries do? Well, they do it with money. If you're not doing these things, the U.S. opposes aid to you if it's non-humanitarian aid. And there's several rankings where in the first tier, countries are doing something about preventing and prosecuting and protecting. In the second tier, countries are not doing enough. Um, there's a second tier watch list, which means that you're getting ready to drop to the third tier. And if you drop to the third tier, the United States says that we will oppose aid to you as long as it's non-humanitarian aid. And um, we will also oppose any other banks or global monitoring systems um, and banking systems to um, give you money either. So it's actually been quite effective. We've seen a lot of countries rise from the third tier up. Um, there's some questions about how effective it is and whether countries are lying or whether the United States is doing enough, but uh, non-governmental organizations, um, uh, embassies, uh, victims from other countries usually report on this kind of information. And uh, Mr. Perrin has actually been recognized as a uh, hero under the TIP report by Senator, uh, Hillary Clinton. So. I want to mention just a few of these uh, protection rights, because this is where my scholarship focuses. Uh, under the TVPA, victims have the right not to be incarcerated like criminals. They also have the right to be treated like crime victims. So if a woman is trafficked and she commits acts of prostitution, which in the United States would be um, illegal, um, she will not be arrested um, under the TVPA. There's also the right to receive protections and assistance if you meet a definition that is defined as severe forms of human trafficking. And this is a little bit different than Canada's law, and I'll describe how in just a minute. So severe forms of trafficking really is two kinds. The first kind is sex trafficking, that's commercial sex acts, where a person is induced to commit them through force, fraud, or coercion. And that's only if you're an adult. And this is, again, under the TVPA. Um, if you are someone who has not yet hit 18 years of age, you do not have to prove that you were coerced, forced, or tricked into uh, commercial sexual exploitation. The fact that you have been sexually exploited is enough to qualify you as a trafficking victim. The second part is, is when you are participating, I mean, you're, you're recruited, you're harbored, you're transport, transported, and it's labor slavery that also involves force, fraud, or coercion for the purpose of um, involuntary servitude, peonage, debt bondage, or slavery. And so if you meet one of these definitions in the United States, you automatically qualify for protection. And protection comes in a number of forms. It can be protection in your rescue. It can be protection as a witness testifying against people. It can also be protection after the fact um, because most or many uh, human trafficking victims uh, come from impoverished backgrounds or um, are marginalized populations. And as a result, they may need resource help, skills training, um, housing, temporary housing, long-term housing, medical, uh, psychological care, um, depending on what have they've been through. So in Canada, which is interesting, the definition of a human trafficking victim is actually a little narrower. Um, there are elements in Canadian law that deal with harboring and recruitment transportation in light of being convicted as a trafficker. But being considered a victim in Canada is a little bit more narrow and this has actually caused some problems in cases because there is a requirement that, the, uh, that, that there's these elements, but there's a requirement that the victim believe that um, she is, uh, is exploited and that she is in fear 
of force against her or someone else, or him or someone else. So for instance, there was a case a couple of years ago that's mentioned in uh, Professor Perrin's book of a young girl who was 14, who was mentally disabled, who was befriended by a boyfriend who was you know, a pimp, uh, who was very abusive to the other girls in the ring that he had, but she believed he was his boyfriend and he constantly um, you know, made her work all day long and she was 14. And because she didn't fear him, because he was actually kind of nice to her, nicer to her than he was the other girls, uh, she was, it was not considered a trafficking case. Um, so that was kind of uh, a problem according to Professor Perrin. Also in Canada, it does not matter the age of the victim. Um, as far as uh, considering trafficking or not, um, this age requirement of if you're under 18 um, does not necessarily apply to become uh, a victim of trafficking. So the other thing I want to mention when we talk about victims of trafficking, and in my reading of Canada, in my brief survey here of people and on the plane, because you know, if I meet a Canadian, you speak for all Canadians, right? <laughs> um, but what happens is when I looked at, when I talked to people, it seems like the idea is that human trafficking happens elsewhere. And if it happens here, it's international victims. There are people that have been brought in, and really this is a problem elsewhere. And I think that this is probably a common misperception in the United States. Of course, trafficking is probably a much larger population, I mean a problem in the United States, um, than it is here just based on population alone. Um, but international victims tend to be favorit favoritized, or uh, that's not really a word. Uh, there's a lot of favoritism towards believing that trafficking victims are international victims. And this is kind of where my research comes in. Um, I am the, the fighter for the underdog. I'm an idealist. I didn't come to law school to make money and be rich. I wanted to make a difference. And I think for me, it really means something to kind of shed light on the person who's overlooked. And maybe some people in the room feel the same way. But international victims are certainly present in every nation around the country. There are victims of human trafficking, uh, whether they be transit countries where people go through them, whether they be source countries who supply these people to be sold and bought and traded, or whether they're destination countries like the United States and Canada. We're a very wealthy country. Both of our countries are. We're very uh, you know, civilized. Uh, we have a great educated group of people in general. And a lot of people from other countries uh, see a, maybe an opportunity to come here and do better um, and have better opportunities than maybe where they were from. And so you have uh, elements of people that are tricked um, or coerced or frauded into coming here um, under the premise that they're going to actually be doing some kind of work or have opportunities that later do not materialize. Um, this is a big generality, but generally most people that are trafficked are poorer. Uh, they come from marginalized populations. They are less educated. Um, this is, a, again, a generality. It doesn't always happen this way. And it exists for both international victims and for domestic victims. So some of the similarities between domestic victims, and when I talk about domestic victims, I'm talking about Canadians. I'm talking about Americans who are trafficked. Um, there's some similarities between our two countries. Typically, the age of domestic victims, and by the way, uh, as far as I can tell in Canada, there have been no cases, as far as I know, and this is very similar to the U.S. of domestic tra labor victims. Uh, they tend to be uh, sexually exploited victims uh, that are domestic. Um, and typically labor victims tend to come from other countries or in the U.S. we have some permanent residents who have not attained citizenship yet but are on the path to that um, who are uh, victims of labor slavery. But the age tends to be really young. In the United States, the average age when I talk about sex trafficking is 13, when most girls enter the sex trade. The same is true for Canada. Um, recruitment. Recruitment for these young girls, typically these young girls come from abused homes, abusive homes. Uh, they're runaways. They may be labeled throwaways, delinquents, uh, druggies, criminal uh, elements involved in their history. Um, and what happens is there are men who know exactly where to find them, bus stops, uh, on the streets, um, you know, running out of their home, you know, crying and screaming, uh, whatever it may be. They look for an opportunity to befriend these girls, usually under the guise that I'm going to be your boyfriend, I'm going to take care of you, and for a couple weeks, life is good. Uh, this guy may feed them, uh, he may love them, he may take care of them, and then after that trust is built, he turns around and begins to sell them. And um, these girls a lot of times come from homes where uh, the trust has already been broken and this just further 
um, is, a, is a trust issue, but perhaps this person has been nicer um, than other people in their lives. Um, and you know, I'm a girl, um, I'm a woman. We, we like to think that there's a Prince Charming. We like to think that there's someone out there that's gonna take care of us. And I think that some of these um, young ladies buy into that as well. Um, typically, they're marginalized people groups, people groups that don't have a lot of power and a lot of authority. In the United States, there's an overwhelming number of African-American girls that are arrested for prostitution, even though it's estimated that, um, that more of the, it's, it's mixed as far as who gets actually into uh, underage prostitution. Uh, there are certainly large numbers of Anglo girls or Caucasian girls, Hispanic girls, Asian girls that do too but more street prostitution is among African-American groups and those are the ones that are often um, seen and arrested in the United States. And here I understand your prostitution laws are different, but I've been told that Native American populations, First Nation populations here, um, tend to be more uh, represented in street prostitution than other areas of prostitution um, and are maybe more visible for that reason. So I want to show you a few video segments. This segment comes from a video, and I've got it up here for any of you that are interested. It's called Very Young Girls. This is like a video that really changed my whole feeling about prostitution and um, domestic sex trafficking because I was a prosecutor. And in the United States, prostitutes can be arrested and charged with prostitution. And so I remember being at the podium and, and a girl pleading guilty or a woman pleading guilty to prostitution. A very vivid memory of mine as a prosecutor was taking a plea for a young lady who had was covered in sores. Uh, she was Caucasian. Um, she had a long history of prostitution arrests. And during the plea, I felt so bad for her that I looked at her information to see how old she was. And I was 25, a brand new lawyer, and she was 25 too. And I just remember thinking how different our lives had turned out. So the video segments I'm going to show you are from uh, Girls Education Mentoring Service, which is one of the more established um, and more productive uh, groups um, that deal with underage prostitution, domestic trafficking, which is considered human trafficking under the TVPA and also under Canada's laws. Um, so I want to show you a few clips. I want to explain a few terms. You'll hear these girls refer to the life and the game which I think is a way to kind of talk about prostitution and pimping and all of that stuff in a more anesthetized way. Um, you'll hear some of the girls refer to being abused or having to forgive their parents. You'll also hear them refer to what's called the track, which essentially is when the cars line up on the street where they're coming around looking for girls um, to, to pick up. And the reason why I want to show you is I want to put a face on these victims. And most of the victims in this video are African American, but there, there are white girls and Hispanic girls as well that in the United States that fall into these categories. But I also want you to see the relationship of the pimp and the abuse these girls suffer in this context. So I'm going to show you just three really cl quick clips. Um, to s and, and we'll go from there. the age of entry is rather young and I want you to see the next two clips just the force and the control and the coercion that these um, pimps have over these girls I'm going to leave and he threw my suitcase at me and told me next time I come in, 
This video, by the way, um, is a video that some pimps in the U.S. took with the hopes that they would get an HBO show on their real-life pimping experiences. Uh, idiots is the word to describe them. Um, the tapes were actually used to um, against them in court, and they both received uh, 10 years. Like 15, around, like, like, show you one more clip about law enforcement's response here in a little bit but I think because these groups are uh, marginalized and because um, it's easy for a lot of people in power to uh, discount them um, they are often legally uh, receiving lesser protections. so the United States is different than Canada in some ways uh, under the United States we have a big imbalance between protections offered to uh, domestic victims and international victims and this was really the primary focus of the article that I just wrote that's going to be published in the winter. But in the United States, if you qualify as an international victim, if you meet that severe form, you are given refugee benefits. You are treated as if you were an asylum victim and you have refugee status. And that includes all of these things. You're given a case manager, you're given housing for at least three years, food, clothing, living expenses, life skills training, medical, dental, psychological treatment, substance abuse counseling, transportation, education, translators, career counseling, job training, job placement, English, cultural and religious preservation, so that your cultural and religious, especially if you're a child, uh, you're, where you came from is preserved. Uh, you are given immigration legal assistance and the right to remain in the United States. And for minors, this actually goes into adulthood. They actually receive these benefits up until the age of 21 and sometimes beyond. Domestic victims are actually excluded 
by the TVPA from receiving any of these benefits or protections. And the reason why I wrote this article was because I interviewed a U.S. attorney, an assistant U.S. attorney in Houston, where there's only one of three human trafficking task force um, units, and he said Americans would be outraged if they knew how many protections international victims get that domestic victims don't. Now, in the three cities, Anaheim, Flor California, uh, Florida, and I think Chicago has in the past and in Houston, uh, the benefits are actually the same. But everywhere else in the US, they are not. And we have a few grants, a few little dollars sent here and sent there. But the overwhelming number of amount of dollars spent on trafficking in the US is for international victims that are trafficked to the US and countries abroad. And so domestic victims are largely ignored. Um, the states, we in the United States have, uh, the, the federal system kind of assumes the state is going to pick up uh, the actual, the slack here. And unfortunately, states, especially in this time of recession, do not have the money to do that. And by the way, I want to go back for just a second. In Canada, um, you do not automatically qualify to receive refugee benefits unless you are indeed a refugee. So not only do you have to prove that you're a domestic trafficking, I mean an international trafficking victim, you also have to prove that if you were deported and you were sent back to your country that there would be a danger or a threat uh, because of the fact of the kind of person, you know, people group you're in or religious or political persecution. So Canada is actually not um, as, as I would say generous as the U.S. when it comes to trafficking victims because they have to actually meet the refugee qualification in order to get refugee-like benefits. Uh, the other thing is uh, in Canada um, there is a lack of services um, available to domestic trafficking victims which I'll talk about here in a moment. So some of the state's legal biases are that we have a hard time identifying victims. Uh, human trafficking is an underground network kind of thing. Uh, it's not something that's out in the open particularly, and so it's hard to identify victims. Uh, Professor Perrin has an excellent uh, list of things that can tip people off to whether it's a labor victim or a sexual trafficking victim, whether it's uh, in, in any kind of situation, it's, it's actually pretty interesting, whether it's a child victim. Um, but in, in the United States, we have 15, and this, this is going to be different obviously than Canada, but we have 1,500 annual arrests for prostitution for girls that are under the age of 18. These are teenage girls that are arrested for prostitution. And um, that's a huge problem. I'm proud of my state, Texas, because the Texas Supreme Court is the only court in the entire nation that has held that it's inconsistent to charge these girls with prostitution where consent to sex is an element, where in the same state we have statutory rape laws that provide that girls under the age of 17 cannot consent to sex. And so there's a, a, obviously a legal problem or a legal conflict there that Texas has ruled in favor of the victim saying you cannot charge them with that kind of thing. We have inadequate housing um, in the United States. Most of these girls that you heard in the video do not qualify to go to homeless shelters or runaway shelters because of their age. They can also, if they have drug problems, be excluded. They can be excluded from domestic violence centers if they don't have a boyfriend. And even if they qualify their pimp, their pimp as their boyfriend, uh, the shelters normally do not accept them. Uh, they are usually runaways from homes and the foster homes or the child welfare system has often failed them and so placing them back into that system is not always an option. Um, there are some studies showing that there is inadequate training of foster parents to recognize whether or not a child has been sexually exploited um, who is placed with them. There are also inadequate services elsewhere. Medical services are inadequate, um, counseling services are inadequate, uh, the system is very bureaucratic. If you want housing, you have to go to this agency, and if you want food, you have to go to that agency, and if you want this, you have to go to that agency. There are a few states. Uh, Texas and Washington are among the first two to pass human trafficking laws at the state level, but they are inadequately funded and inadequately uh, served, um, and states recognize this. Washington is doing something to actually fix the situation. Whether or not it actually proves useful is another matter. But Washington, if you are a John and you pick up a, a young girl or you're arrested for prostitution, they seize your car. And in order to get the car out, and I believe Canada has some similar laws, in order to get the car out, you have to pay an impoundment fee of several hundred dollars. This fee is now going to fund services in Washington, but the reality is I don't know whether or not enough men are being arrested or cars are being impounded in order to actually make up the difference.
In New York, the New York state is the first one to pass a safe harbor law. Um, and the state recommends that this, the different uh, counties and cities have safe houses for the girls, but they have a little clause in there that says if funds are available. And wouldn't you know it, unless the legislature says funds are available and sets it aside, they're never available. So New York is actually lacking in safe houses even though they recommend uh, that local jurisdictions have them. So my theory about the reasons why this exists is that our initial information about human trafficking was the international variety. It's the poor union that the Soviet Union disbanded and now these women are being sold. And, and we think of the iconic human trafficking, particularly sex trafficking victim, as being the woman from the Eastern European countries that failed, for, who, who was sold. Um, and usually this woman is thought of as being chained somewhere and very grateful to see the police when they bust in and rescue her. In reality, this is not, this is more of a myth. Um, but what happens is, because our initial information was about international trafficking, our laws, especially in the US, favor international sex trafficking. Uh, we are not as knowledgeable about agricultural trafficking, uh, other forms of labor trafficking, and as a result, our laws really favor the, the, the iconic victim. Um, Congress's funding and legislative bias is also apparent. Uh, domestic victims were not even recognized as potential human tra trafficking victims until five years after the TVPA was passed in 2005. There were no federal grants given to domestic victims until 2009. Um, in 2010 and in 2011, Congress tried, tried to pass a bill that would allow domestic victims to receive the same protections in the United States as international victims, and the bill was struck down and voted against twice. Um, hundreds of millions of dollars are spent abroad, and tens of millions over the years have been spent on domestic trafficking, um, and a little has been actually accomplished with that. In Canada, um, I've done some research here that suggests that the media is also kind of biased in the way that they report human trafficking studies or uh, information. Uh, there are authors that suggest that the way that the media frames it is an immigration issue, is a crime issue as opposed to a humanitarian issue. Now, whether that's true or not, I don't know. I'm going on what Canadian academics have suggested. Um, but there's certainly, I think it's interesting because in this book, um, and I don't, I don't think there's an overhead way to show information here, is there? Okay. There's a book here that has an advertisement that I thought was interesting. And it's uh, apparently in Manitoba. Uh, Manitoba's Stop Sex with Kids campaign targets the demand for sexual exploitation. And there's a picture of a young girl who is Caucasian. And she's talking to someone in a pickup truck. and says, sex is being bought from, child, from a child right now in Manitoba. And um, I don't know whether or not this person was chosen because of her race or her ethnicity, or whether it would matter in the public's interest if she was um, of a different race or ethnicity. But I do know that in the United States there has been controversy because a lot of ads to prevent trafficking feature Asian women or Caucasian women. And there is an African American writer, um, an academic, who suggests that she was actually at a conference where um, people had talked about how they were going to structure the advertisements, and if they used a picture of an African-American girl, perhaps no one would care. Um, and I've heard the same thing said here about First Nation um, girls. So it, it is interesting kind of this bias that we have and whether people are going to be interested or invested, depending on who the girl looks like or where she comes from. Um, there are two quotes that I want to read from Rachel Lloyd. It's actually, I'm going to kind of read it together. Um, for who produced the Very Young Girls video and actually has a very successful uh, uh, nonprofit. Um, she says, while commercial sexual exploitation can and does happen to any child, this issue disproportionately affects low-income <coughs> children, children of color, children who have been in the child welfare system, children who have been in the juvenile justice system, children who do not have a voice in public policy, children who are frequently ignored. Traffickers and exploiters know exactly who to target, who will be featured on the news, who will be seen as a real victim. And there's actually been some studies in the US about who makes the missing child report on the news. Uh, Natalie Holloway, who was a blonde Caucasian girl in the United States, made the national news and world attention for being disappear going disappearing abroad. Um, there are disappearing children all the time in the US who never make the news. And there are suggesting, there's people that suggest that 
um, that, that sometimes the, the community may not care depending on um, who the child is. Another quote she says, as a nation, this is speaking of the United States, we have graded and rated other countries on how they address trafficking within their borders and yet have effectively ignored the sale of our own children within our own borders. We have created a dichotomy of acceptable and unacceptable victims, wherein Katya from the Ukraine will be seen as a real victim and provided with services and support, but Keisha from the Bronx will be seen as a, quote, willing participant, someone who is out there because she, quote, likes it and who is criminalized and thrown in detention or jail. And so this is not only a problem in the US and Canada, but it's also a problem elsewhere. And it affects our, our ideas about who is a victim, who needs to be protected, and who doesn't. Who can be written off and who needs help affect our legal system, unfortunately. And um, it has resulted in a law enforcement bias, which is where a lot of these cases start. Uh, human trafficking victims are usually identified at the time of their arrest in the US. So the United States, uh, the law enforcement response is um, kind of, uh, it's been uh, described in a lot of ways, um, not all positive. Uh, sometimes law enforcement force girls to get help by arresting them. Um, there is a lack of training. Uh, there are apathetic responses. Oh, it's just a runaway. She's always causing problems. She's a delinquent. Um, and the reality, too, is that some of these victims do not cooperate like international victims do. Uh, they have a very close tie with their pimp, or they have been manipulated, and they have what's called Stockholm Syndrome, where they start to identify with him and want to protect him. Um, and so they don't always cooperate and receive help gratefully, um, as if, you know, and international victims t typically do. Um, so I want to show you a clip, the last clip, of uh, the police response. I want to warn you there's a little bit of language in here, um, but you'll see a very frustrated mother trying to get help for her runaway daughter and a police response that is less than ideal. And this was all done with hidden cameras. Excuse me. Can I talk to you for a second? Yes. Hey, you just want to stay out here. It's my daughter, she's missing. You saw my daughter, you saw the fire. Does she have braids in her hair? Blonde braids. For real? How do you want me to get to the Vanessa? Are you a prostitute? What, what area is it? Do you know where she is? Oh, God, I can't believe you're helping me like this. God bless you. You're the only person that called us. My name is Bob, this is the pill. Sometimes law enforcement's response is not ideal. Sometimes officers don't have the training to recognize these things. Um, sometimes um, uh, girls that turn to uh, prostitution or are forced into it uh, don't appear to law enforcement as people that they want to help. Um, there are a lot of legal fallacies or, or omitted evidence, I would say, or omitted statements that the officer kind of left out. Yes, you do need a search warrant to bust a door down, but there were responses he could have given and help that he could have given to this mother and to this situation um, that he didn't. Um, Canada, Canada's law enforcement response to victims has been mixed as well, um, from what I gather. Forced deportation is something that has occurred with international victims, where as soon as they are detected, they are forced out if they don't meet the refugee criteria. 
As a result, um, when the traffickers are brought to, brought to trial, there is no witness to testify about the trafficking scheme or what was going on. Um, there is actually some really big frustration between local law enforcement agencies who have said this is a trafficking victim and CIC's response of denying that. Um, so there's, it, it's interesting. Um, there's been, in the book, there's in instances of apathetic or lethargic responses to trafficking of First Nation victims. Um, there are very limited uh, 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 beds available for victims or at-risk girls. Um, there is a lack of training among the police departments and there is little cooperation between the provinces. So if girls are trafficked international or in, internally between the different provinces of Canada, uh, Canada's response uh, in, her, in her province has not been that great um, from what I gather. Um, there is a story in here about some girls that were brought to Saskatoon who were transferred um, from Manitoba and uh, the police response was just uh, pretty sorry. Um, what I will say is this morning I ate breakfast next to three Saskatoon um, police officers and um, I kind of came up to him and said I'm an American and I have a question. How much training do you guys have? And um, their response was well, we've had a couple people come talk to us you know, a couple times. And I said is it international or domestic? And they said we don't have domestic trafficking problems here. And I said um, uh, has there ever been any domestic cases? And there was one female police officer who said, well, there was that one house, and she looked at the other female pro officer who said, yeah, but that doesn't count. And I don't know what, why it didn't count. I didn't want to follow up with it. I felt I was already intruding on their breakfast as it is. Um, but it clearly is something that a lot of probably Saskatoonians, is that what you guys call each other, uh, would, would, uh, would say does not exist here when in fact it appears that it does and it exists in every province, not just the most populous cities in Canada. Um, so, there are several implications of a two-tier or, or a worthy and not worthy protection system. First of all, the United States, because it was the first one to pass international legislation, um, is, is really spreading the bias elsewhere. Um, and there are other countries that are treating their citizens and non-citizen victims differently. Um, there are also large disparate treatments of male victims, of boy victims, and of homosexual and transgender victims um, because of other biases and the idea that this only happens to women and children, um, and it doesn't. Uh, global partnerships are really undermined when the United States tells, for example, Kuwait, we're not going to give you any money because you're treating victims differently on citizenship, and yet the U.S. is doing the same thing. Um, so it's really kind of hard to respect a system that itself is flawed. And this categorization of victims who are worthy and who are not really kind of violates the inclusive definition and rights guaranteed under international law and national law for all human trafficking victims. And, and this is a problem. So I want to talk briefly, just very briefly because I know I'm running short on time, um, sex tourism. I thought this was really interesting uh, in, in Canada and U.S. The U.S. is worse than, I'm sure, uh, Canada by many, many measures. But 150 men plus men in Can that are Canadians who have traveled abroad for sex tourism have contacted consulates to get help with prosecution and to make sure that their, uh, their rights are protected. So we know at least 150 men have been charged um, abroad for uh, soliciting uh, children um, that, are, that are Canadians. Um, there's international domestic sex trafficking going on in, in the following types of places, massage parlors, strip clubs, street prostitution, indoor prostitution, online prostitution, and calls for women to model. And in Houston we have the same exact issues um, with, with, with this thing too. Uh, there have been 40 women who have been documented who have been drugged or uh, forced or maybe coerced to go to the United States for sex trafficking, Canadian women. Um, and there have been 30 trafficking arrests in recent history, all of whom who have pled guilty were charged with domestic sex trafficking. Um, the sentences are pretty paltry, and of course the United States uh, incarcerates far too many people and has far too heavy of a hand in punishment, but the, uh, the, the sentences run about two or three years. Uh, and by the time these men actually serve their sentence, they've been in jail so long that they don't really have to serve any more time. And that's something that Professor Perrin criticizes um, Canadian judges for. Uh, the only incidences in Canada of labor trafficking are international labor trafficking. And I thought this was really interesting. 
Um, there's information in his book about 18 to 20 kids per year arrive in the Toronto airport unaccompanied and under suspicious circumstances where it looks like someone put them on a plane, they gave them a cell phone, said when you get to Toronto, make a phone call to so-and-so, and the kids say they have to pay a debt and they're underage. And about 18 to 20 kids arrive just in the Toronto airport alone um, under those very suspicious circumstances. And if they do not meet the refugee criteria, they are sent back to their countries. Um, there have been 12 arrests in recent years for um, sex traffic or child trafficking rings. And this is just little information here and there. And the reason why it's hard to get a big picture of Canadian uh, trafficking incidents is because there is no national reporting system for this type of offense. And so all of this information came from uh, what we would call in the state's Freedom of Information Act requests um, for various law departments um, or for law enforcement agencies. Um, I just want to conclude by saying that this, this happens. Uh, it happens in Canada. It happens in Saskatoon. And you know, my goal is to kind of educate and to really draw awareness to the domestic trafficking victim and to understand that these victims need our protection just as much as international victims, maybe even more, uh, because they are marginalized, because they are discounted in their own countries. And were they to go abroad, they might actually receive uh, more assistance. And this is true for the US, it's true for Canada. Um, I do want to uh, open it up for questions if there's time. And I wanted to leave here some resources um, from Canadian uh, literature. Uh, Benjamin Perrin's book is very informative and good. Uh, a lot of the information he includes in there is information that is also true for the US. Uh, Kathleen Cross wrote a paper about uh, newspapers bias when it comes to prostitution. And there's several uh, articles that I consulted for uh, Aboriginal and First Nation uh, trafficking issues, which obviously is a problem here in Canada. So, any questions?